Yes, yeah. and they had a party. That's right. That's where we met. Yeah, that was the Kumbaya moment. <laughs> and much has happened. And much has happened to you. We're on, by the way, now. Oh, am I allowed to be you drinking water? And this is just, just for you. Yeah, it's just for us. Yeah, we're, okay. not, we're not going. See, you, you work in a world of CBC. Of course, you're pretty much, you're radio. I'm radio. Yeah. Big difference. Yeah, it is a big yeah. difference. <laughs> yeah. In fact, I was just hearing about the um, event that's happening in... Um, August. Yes. It sounds really interesting. That may be a moment. It may be a moment. Because it's quite different from right, exactly. the other one. We couldn't do it if it was similar. But um, I was just telling um, Paul, I mean, we did the documentary uh, of the prosecutors. We did a documentary about Lilydale. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it sort of feels like... Um, familiar territory this place. Did you even have to go to Lilydale to Well, I didn't. I sent someone to Lilydale. He spent four days there. Is that right? And, uh, and it was a great piece, a fascinating piece, just about the community. Yeah, yeah. You know? So, very different from Chautauqua, that's for sure. Well, since you were last here, much has happened to you. I mean, we have a stage play. Mm-hmm. And you have a movie? There a movie? There's a feature documentary, okay. um, which uh, came out, my goodness, three years ago and was in a, a theatrical release mm -hmm. and there is still a feature film uh, in the works so um, yeah it just a, and we have this 10th anniversary album yeah. have you seen that no oh you haven't oh well, we got a book I mean is that the book yeah, yeah, yeah the new book yeah new book we got that is it, that in it is there something in there that there's about 70 new pages in there oh my gosh yeah, yeah. and exactly. and they're really really lovely. It's um, updates on the story, uh, some new material about Hannah, um, new photographs, and then a whole bunch about uh, projects that kids have done. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so that came out in um, almost a year ago exactly. Um, yeah, 10 years. It was last year. So. Do you pinch yourself thinking how this sort of came to be, really? Uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> You know, I guess for the tape, kind of roughly, how, how did it all happen? I mean, it, it kind of came to you as a, you, and you converted it into a... Well, I read, I read about it in a community newspaper, the mm -hmm. Canadian Jewish News, which just announced it was folding last oh, really? week, uh, after many years, like many other newspapers uh, are. Uh, so that's where I first heard about it, and then I turned it into a radio documentary, and then out of that... Um, that woman I mentioned to you earlier, mm -hmm. my publisher, Margie Wolf, who was a, a friend already, who, who was a child of survivors, said, turn this into a book. And so, uh, after much uh, procrastinating, I did. And yeah, it's, it's stunning what's happened. It, it's, it's unbelievable. Were you, were you a Holocaust student before then? Oh, yeah. Okay, so, so mm -hmm. you had a fundamental background and, and then... Well, I wouldn't say I was a student. Okay. I mean, I was never officially a student. Oh, I was okay. a... Um, I had gone to, um, when I was 13, to, to visit Buchenwald with my family. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and after that became completely obsessed mm -hmm. with, with that part of history. And, and uh, I mean, my university degree was in history, but it wasn't in Holocaust history at all. It was more a personal interest, but it was an enduring personal interest uh, that, uh, well, I was 13, um, yes, 45 years later, <laughs> still lives. Still a child. Yes, <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, and, uh, yeah, it just never, it just never ebbed. But I, as a kid, I was really, I just gobbled up everything I could get my hands on. And, and you know, I always tell kids that uh, when I was 13, nobody talked about this. Mm -hmm. Nobody. Uh, survivors didn't talk much about it. It certainly wasn't taught in schools. There were no books for kids. It was just not on the radar. And so I had to search uh, hard to get stuff to read, but I did. And, uh, yeah. And, and when I look back on my life now, um, there was this thread that runs all the way through it. Um, How so? Well, I, you know, I was interested as a 13-year-old. I, um, I now, were your, was your family involved? No. Or was there any? No. Lawsuit? No. The only involvement, so-called, 
is that I was Jewish, right. you know, and so whether you like it or not, you're involved. And um, and I did, you know, I wrote essays about it when I was in school, and then I did some radio, and I I um, did a series when I was in 1989, six hours called "Lost Innocence: The Children of World War II," and it, there's just this sort of thing that carries through mm -hmm. um, my professional life and my personal life and and the explanation for it I don't have mm -hmm. um, other than that it's a tremendously compelling part of human experience you know what part of this story first grabbed you I mean, was there, a, there had to be an aha moment where you said aha it was actually a, a bolt um, I, I described that in the in the in the uh, anniversary album because I had made this um, documentary series, the six hour one, and it just about um, just about killed me. <laughs> it was a really tough, tough experience, the best radio experience I've ever had in my life. It was spectacular, but boy, it was hard. And I just swore off making documentaries. I thought I can't. I'm not doing this again. Mm -hmm. And I'm not doing it on this subject. I'm not going near this subject again, except in my own personal reading. And then, and then I, I still remember where I was sitting when I read this, the story the first time. It was just boom. And it was, I mean, there were so many things about it. But the main thing that, that, um, that drew me was the weird combination of Japan, Canada, yeah. and, and Czechoslovakia, and and also the, the, the search, you know, the, the, the mix of uh, horror and hope and, you know, sadness and connection. And it, it is a very unusual story that way. And I, I mean, I think that's the main reason. There are many different reasons, I think, why the story has, has gone as far and wide as it has. But I think the main reason is that combination. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I get asked uh, often by people, you know, um, uh, why did you write this story instead of somebody else's story? And will you write my story? Mm -hmm. Which is kind of heartbreaking because um, every story is important, but every story can't be a book, right. you know? But this one had the ingredients, and I knew it just... I mean, I didn't know it was a book, but I knew it was a documentary. Right. It just... my you know, my hair stood on end, so. Did you know beforehand that George was still alive? I mean, when, when you first, cut, when the first article was out in the... Yes, Jewish I knew, I knew from that article that he was alive. Um, I didn't realize that he lived about um, a mile from my house. No <laughs> kidding. Yeah. Um, was, yeah. Was he a willing collaborator in the story? Yes, very willing collaborator. Okay. And, uh, I mean, I called him. I cold called him. I um, I was away for the weekend. I, I remember all these weird little memories. They're, they're completely irrelevant to what you're interested in. But I was. I, I love this part of it. Yeah. I, do. <laughs> I was away uh, for the weekend with a friend in Niagara on the Lake, and I knew I wanted to contact George, and I didn't. And I knew also that. Uh, Fumiko was going to arrive in Canada sometime soon and I thought I can't wait I can't wait and I phoned him from there and you know I just looked him up in the phone book and are you the George Brady that and he was and he was very willing and in fact when it was over the radio part of it um, and the book idea came up. He was more than willing and, and very much wanted that to happen. And, and you know, my life has definitely uh, changed hugely because of this. But yeah. his, uh, it, you know, it's been a radical um, shift because yeah. he, he um, there's meaning in his sister's life, right. you know? As at, at the same time as having evolved those memories, I mean, here he's in Canada, uh, 
uh, and it just kind of e evokes a time when maybe he'd probably forgotten it until this all had surfaced. For, you mean he had forgotten? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I he, never forget. No, it. you don't forget it. Um, he didn't talk about it. Right. Uh, he used to say that um, you know he had he had three sons uh, in his first marriage, um, and uh, he used to s joke to them that the number on on his arm uh, was a phone number. Mm -hmm. And he really didn't talk uh, about the experience, and uh, and he kind of prided himself on being that guy who you know, lived for the present and future. And mm -hmm. but he had nightmares um, about Hannah. He he sort of he he used to say he he had come to terms with the death of his parents, but he couldn't come to terms with mm -hmm. her death because he was supposed to be her guardian. Um, and she was so young. So um, those nightmares ended, you know? I mean, well, it doesn't mean that it isn't terribly painful still. It is. And, and it did bring up a lot of pain. There's no question. But on balance, uh, it's given him uh, a new lease on life and 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 just tremendous meaning i mean mm -hmm. he 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 sees you know that hundreds of thousands millions actually of kids right. know about his sister you know and him right and and are thinking about it and learning from it and you know it's pretty great because of course most people don't have that experience yeah. What's the surprise to you? Here we are looking at a little more, more than 10 years since it really, the documentary, the book. What's, you sit back there, wow. I don't think I could have anticipated this. It's been widely accepted. That would be an understatement. Yeah. I, I, I am amazed on so many different levels, but um, I was amazed by the, uh, how, how the story was embraced. Uh, not by individuals, uh, which it was, but by, you know, places like this and school systems mm -hmm. uh, and uh, public boards, Catholic boards. Um, it, it is, it, it, it seems to cut across all kinds of ages, backgrounds, institutions, uh, it's, it's, it's totally stunning yeah. <laughs> to me, still. Well, what's Fumiko, uh, uh, how's he doing? It's, well, she, 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 she yeah. She, she. Uh, well, she's, she uh, is still in Japan, mm -hmm. and she travels constantly around Japan, going to schools. The center doesn't exist anymore. Um, she decided, and it was a smart decision, um, given rents in Tokyo, mm -hmm. that it would be better for her to go out than to uh, try and bring people in, that she would reach, reach more people that way. So her, her life is, is, is sort of on the road. And, you know, it's not easy. Right. Uh, and she's not a kid anymore, you know. Uh, she was a very young woman when, when this all happened and I had brown hair, you know, I mean it was <laughs> a lot, a lot has happened over the 11 years but she's still very, very committed to the story and it, it really is her working life. Yeah. How's George? He's pretty good. He's, uh, he's 85. He's, uh, he, he had an accident uh, a few weeks ago in, uh, with a saw. Uh, with, where his fingers and the saw met each other, which mm -hmm. is not not attractive, um, not not happy making. So I'm I'm actually going to see him next week. Um, but he's hanging in. Does he show with you? Does he come? Does he go out with you for events? No, and I don't do very many events anymore. Oh. I um I pick and choose really carefully because mm -hmm. I could. Uh, I mean, for the first five years. Um, I was, it was almost like a second full-time job. Right. And I took chunks of time off my regular work and um, uh, and then I, I made a decision at one point that 
I, I just couldn't do two full-time right. jobs. I was exhausted. And at the same time, I feel a tremendous obligation to the story um, to keep it alive and out there. Um, so I, I, um, I pick very carefully. And George doesn't really do much uh, of that anymore. Have you had it? Will you have, or did you have a big 10th anniversary? Yes, we did. Yeah, yeah we did. In Toronto? In Toronto, yeah. yeah. Did George show for that? Oh, yes. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. Speaking of your day job, uh, I mean, you have won a significant number of awards and honors because of your documentary, radio documentaries. Uh, and I uh, have listened to you. I actually go online and listen uh -huh. to you, to, to the work product. How did you get in that field? Well, um, I, uh, I was a CBC radio junkie from the time I was about 13, the same time as I... Um, had that experience mm -hmm. at Buchenwald and, and, and decided that was a great interest of mine. I, I, um, I didn't go to journalism school. I, um, my degree was in history and women's studies. And, but I always wanted to work at CBC Radio. After university, I worked for three years uh, at a multicultural archive, a history, a history job, uh, and I kept applying to CBC. <laughs> I applied to be in the mail room and I was rejected. <laughs> um, and then finally I, I, I sold a freelance piece um, uh, and the person who uh, I worked with on that got me an in to my first job on a local morning show and I have been there for um, 34 years and I think I've been very lucky. How's it work? I, I I, I don't know if you did this one or not, but I listened just two days ago yeah. to the day that Margaret Thatcher resigned, mm -hmm, and that mm -hmm, was fabulous, mm -hmm, entertaining, and mm -hmm, my God, all mm -hmm. the things that were going on. Uh, was that yours? Was you part mm -hmm. of that? Well, that documentary it was, was made ago. probably 20 years ago. Yeah, 91, so, so I was Yeah, 91. Years. No, I was in 91. I was... Um, the executive producer of As It Happens. I don't know if you know that program. That's a nightly current affairs program um, that runs 6.30 to 8 every night. Okay. Um, and Michael, who is the host of the Sunday edition, was host of As It Happens then. Michael Enright. Yes, okay. who also happens to be my partner. <laughs> yeah. So, yes. Uh, so, um, no, I wasn't part of Margaret Thatcher. Okay. How does it work? I mean, it, you come up with an idea, and you yeah. say, all right, uh, I want to do something on the wild world of the Robert Jackson Center. Right. Uh, how, do you, how do you manage that? I mean, you got, somebody's got to get some talking, somebody's got to yeah. talk to yeah. folks, yeah. but ultimately you've got to write a script. You've got yeah. to have a master mm -hmm. plan and get the music and all of that. Mm -hmm. How does it work? Well, my job is, as the documentary editor is to, um, well, I, I come up with a lot of the ideas and then I assign them mm -hmm. to a documentary maker. We have three uh, full-time documentary makers and then freelance documentary makers and some people who also work on the program who do the odd documentary. Um, we talk about the story. Um, they go out into the field. They collect tape of interviews, sound, ambience, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. experience bring it back, toss it up, um, and, and try and give it some shape. And my job at that point is, is that they come to me with their rough um, uh, project. Mm -hmm. And my job is to, to turn it into, with them, um, uh, something golden. So, so you'll, you'll do the editing. Yes. You'll sit there and... Yeah. Yeah. And it's a very... Making documentaries is really hard. So, and I'm very... Uh, I have a lot of um, uh, sympathy, empathy for the doc makers because it's really hard working in the field. Document Radio people, unlike television people, work alone. Mm -hmm. So there's nobody to say, did you think that worked? Or, you know, do you think I should do this? It's all you. And you have one chance, and you're out in the field, and you bring it back, and, you think, and you've got hours of tape, and you have to turn that into a story. But that's the skill. 
that's the skill. But you know, I am so lucky because I get to say, you know, this is interesting and say, I'd like you to go and find out more about it. So. Did you just do the one on Jerry Horwath, uh, Voice of the Blue Jays? Oh, that was an interview. Oh, it was an interview? Yeah, was an interview. Jerry yeah. Howarth. Yeah. Howarth, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. kind of stuff is, is I, I love what you do. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm amateur, but I've done hundreds of interviews. Yeah. And uh, at some point in my golden age, take those and turn them into actual stories because there's there's a whole lot of Nuremberg Jackson yes. life stories. I have yeah. I think I have 75 interviews of people which I did 15 years ago uh, of people who actually just were uh, they may have curried his horse. They may have polished the brass on his boat because he died in 54. But mm -hmm. they all have a very specific That word is memory. so valuable. Yeah. It's so fabulous that yeah. you did that. Yeah. So yeah. fantastic. So because that's the stuff that is so easily lost, mm -hmm. you know? And I knew that when I was an archivist, and I knew it when I was working in radio. Going and doing that kind of oral history, ugh, it's fabulous, yeah. Greg. You should do something with it. So, well, I mean, so right now, Interestingly enough, uh, I, I, you know, I took these little clips, these little vignettes, put them kind of back to back to back to back here, and friends and family, knew, as they knew Jackson, mm -hmm. put it on mm -hmm. a, in fact, it's on a VHS. It's how long mm -hmm. it was. Mm -hmm. Now I'm slicing and dicing and putting them up on YouTube, mm -hmm. just to archive it. It's a video scrapbook. You know. Oh, you videotaped. Oh yeah. Oh, I did. Oh. So, so you've got video and audio, yeah, yeah. and is the audio broadcast quality? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Good so, for you. So it's uh, so somebody needs to make a documentary. Well, that's the point. I mean, mm -hmm. in many sense, I'm throwing it up on, on a, I'm throwing it up on a YouTube. I, we mm -hmm. have a Jackson YouTube site. You guys watch it. Mm -hmm. I can tell you what's there. Mm -hmm. You want the horses? I'll give you five people. Mm -hmm. You want this boat? You want that? You want Jackson as a neighbor? I'll give you that. You want a story mm -hmm. about his kids? Here's. And then then the, then the documentarian mm -hmm. with with the assets, mm -hmm. a little music, a little pictures, you mm -hmm. know, the stuff that. It's a way, way above my pay grade. Well, when is the, you know, NPR or something should, yeah, should, should, I mean, is it, there must be a big anniversary coming up. When's the next one? Well, there is seemingly every year. I know. We come up with something. I know. But there's, when, when, so. Actually, 50, he died in 54, so his uh, uh, oh. 60th, 60th right. anniversary of his death. And what were the dates of the Nuremberg trials? 45, 46. Well. So this should come out yeah. in 2015. Right. So you can be th I'm giving you a scoop here. I know, I but have. I couldn't do that for Canadian radio. Yeah. Yeah, That's no, the thing. Not a draw. You know? In fact, I can't figure out. I wish you had a prosecutor sitting around and doing something who was working with the British. I've never found a Nuremberg Connect in Canada. Really? Well, I'll tell you there's a Nuremberg Connect in Canada because when I was in um, Germany, some years ago with the book. I went to the new Holocaust Museum in Berlin mm -hmm. and I was completely shocked. At the end of the museum they had uh, films showing mm -hmm. and the film of the, not the first tier trial, but the second tier. Twelve of them, yeah. It was filmed by the National Film Board of Canada. Oh, you're kidding. And the film in Berlin said National Film Board of Canada. It was amazing. I don't know what the story is, but there is a story, I'm sure, of how that happened. Wow. Yeah, so there is a Canadian yeah, there connection. It is. Oh, I'd like to see this. That's a scoop. Mm -hmm. That's worth pursuing. Mm -hmm. Somebody mm -hmm. in Toronto who might be, who was a young kid, probably filmed it. Mm -hmm. There's your call. Don't you, get, don't you have a little email call you blast out? Mm -hmm. Just at the Jackson mm -hmm. Center, I noted this. The president was ecstatic. Yeah, I'd completely forgotten about it until now. Yeah, this could be you and I. Maybe have, have an interview with some guy. Wow. Now that, yeah. Now there's your Germany, Canada, United States. Germany. Right. See, this, right. Is, this is sort of a right. multinational moment in time. Karen, I don't want to tell you what to do your job, but. <laughs> what, part of, what part of the, speaking of your job, we're off, we got to digress. Uh, you, 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 because you do documentary, yeah, there's certain types or genres that just drive you and say, ah, I love musical ones. I love the, the plays, the arts. Or what is it that easily, more easily pulls at your heartstring? 
Well, I have to say that I am drawn to the dark, mm -hmm. uh, not just this dark, um, uh, but in in um, I mean the range of the 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 kind the joy of working on a program like I do is that the world's our oyster. We can do whatever we want. We don't have to do news. We're not tied to that, you know, feeding a goat or, or uh, so we can do anything. Um, I love doing the historical stuff, always. I'm doing, uh, working, the, the piece that's running this coming Sunday um, is, uh, is about the first group of students from the People's Republic of China who ever studied in North America came and studied at a university in Ottawa. Okay. And it's 40 years since they came and we go back to the Chinese students who arrived to find all these long-haired dope smoking <laughs> students in the Carlton dorms um, and some of the students who were involved in their acculturation. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I love, I love doing those things. I love doing things about aging that is a passion of mine. Mm -hmm. um, and I love doing documentaries without narration. I am. Um, that's that's been, hard. It is hard, but I've done it since the very beginning of when I made documentaries. I didn't even know I was doing it, but I, um, I've always been drawn to no narration. Uh, one vignette, we had Fred Korematsu here, a very Japanese internment, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and there was a very famous Supreme Court case which Jackson wrote an opinion, uh, dissenting opinion, in favor of Fred Korematsu, who was a Japanese American, put in internment even though he was an American. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. Long story. But uh, they did a documentary called Of Civil Wrongs and Rights on Korematsu's life, and the guy won a couple of Emmys, and he was here. Mm -hmm. And when the documentary was done, hour and a half, it struck me. At no point did I hear a talking head. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I asked him. I said, "Oh yeah, that's." In, in the doc, film documentaries, exceedingly difficult, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where you have yeah. the first person yeah. sort of they walk their way through the whole story. Mm -hmm. And so to hear you do that, I'm mm -hmm. equally impressed. Yeah, how hard I love doing that. It is hard. It's a different kind. It's a different art form almost mm -hmm. to do it um, without script, but. I, that's the way I like to work best. Obviously there are sometimes gaps. Do you send somebody out in the field to pick up the gap? Sometimes, yeah. yeah. I don't like to have to do that because, you know, if somebody comes back and didn't, doesn't bring home what's necessary, um, I can't often send them back if they've gone far afield. But, um, yeah, sometimes. That also puts a lot of responsibility on the field person to sort of have their own script in their head. Oh, absolutely. It's really hard work. Yeah. It's really hard work. But it's, it's also, I mean, I, I just uh, uh, had an email before I came from a, one of our doc makers who was in a prison in upstate New York, uh, not, or in the Catskills actually, uh, we're doing a piece about a contemporary dance troupe in a in a maximum security prison. And he sent me a picture of him and the guys. Uh, these are guys who've done not nice things, really not nice things. But he, David said he had a spectacular experience there with the woman who leads the troop and with these men. And I wrote him back and I said, that's why we love our jobs. Mm -hmm. And it's true. Mm -hmm. I mean, how many people get to do things like that? Yeah. You know? So I feel very very blessed in that. Has your son asked you about Hannah's suitcase? Oh yes, huh? yeah. He, um, it was very much a part of his growing up. I mean, it was published when he was six. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't tell him about it uh, when he was six. And I was very nervous about him finding out what the story was. And a very wise person, I don't even remember who it was, uh, when he was six, told me, you don't have to tell him the story. Um, he doesn't need to know the whole story. Just tell him about, that it's about a girl who died in a war. And I did, and that was enough mm -hmm. for a six-year-old. But then about two years later, I did read him the story. Mm -hmm. And he had a very quiet 
reaction. So quiet, I was a bit worried about it. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I pushed him to tell me what his reaction was, and he finally said he didn't, didn't want to tell me. And I pushed and pushed, and finally he did. And he said, you know, I don't want to be Jewish anymore. Mm. And I was just gobsmacked, you know, and really, it just took my breath away uh, for about 10 seconds. And then I thought, that's a perfectly logical reaction for an eight-year-old to a story like that, you know? Um, and, uh, and luckily I was quick on my feet <laughs> that time, and I told him about all the people he knew who were Jewish, who knew all about this history, but were still happy to be who they were, and you know. <laughs> but it was, it was a, a real moment when he said that. Uh, but then, you know, as he was growing up, uh, those were the years when all his peers were reading Hannah's Suitcase, and you know, it was just out there and everywhere all the time. So it was, it was exciting for him, too, because, I mean, he got to come to Chautauqua. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, he got to come to Australia and, uh, and BC and, you know, all, all kinds of, of wonderful um, places and meet all kinds of wonderful people. So it's been a, an experience for him, too. This was your first and currently your only. That would be correct. And, and, and any other on the horizon? You know, I um, no mm -hmm. is the short answer. Um, I keep, um, I mean, I certainly worked on the anniversary album, mm -hmm. but it's not the same. Uh, and uh, I think that my working life is as much as I can do right now. And maybe when I retire, uh, I might write something else. Or maybe someday I'll be sitting on a couch like I was with Hannah and just be struck by a bolt of lightning about a story, you know, that I can't look away from even though I don't have any time. <laughs> but I, I, uh, I mean, I, well, you know, this, this, this one has kept me so busy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it hasn't left a lot of fallow time, you know? Well, we're, we're thrilled. We, we know that uh, you've said no to a lot of people, so yeah. we're thrilled that you said yes to us. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. I really am. It was so nice to see familiar faces, yeah. you know? Because it's, it's an interesting experience uh, if you haven't done that kind of thing in your life before, to keep walking into these new worlds, and completely new people that you've never met, you know, and... and uh, and sometimes it's really hard work, you know? Um, so it's nice to be in a sort of familiar place. <laughs> well, you know, everybody, it's a beautiful thing uh, of what you do, because uh, you're capturing uh, moments in time, and you uh, also, because people, everybody's got a story. Mm -hmm. And your job as a documentarian is to extract that. Yeah. Uh, and. I, in my world, I'm a lawyer by trade, right, that's, my, right. that's my day job. But Lots of stories of, there, too. Lots of stories there, but uh, this is much more fun because you can, uh, uh, there, is, there are some interesting threads, and uh, as I'm really going back through all those guys, just, I mean, hundreds of interviews I've done. It's mm -hmm. hard to believe when you do one at a time, one at a time, that all of a sudden there is such an amazing amount. And it's not all Jackson, it's sports, mm -hmm. it's old-time baseball mm -hmm. guys, it's mm -hmm. somebody who's... You're a baseball guy? Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever done anything on the Expos? The Montreal Expos, the kind of the team that was. Yeah. No. Now, Michael is a big baseball fan. Mm. He's the one who wanted to talk to Jerry Howarth. He did an interview with Jerry Howarth last year mm -hmm. um, and then had him back. People love that guy. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't know the history of the Expos. I know that when I was a little kid growing up, the people across the street had a dog named Expo. That's all I remember. <laughs> But I don't know the history of the Montreal Expos. Well, they, uh, they had an affiliation in Jamestown. So for 19 years, they actually owned the Class A team. Oh, this was a Jamestown. farm team? Yeah. The, oh, the you're Expos. kidding. So the, uh, you know, Tim Raines and Andre Dawson's, the Galarabas, oh. Randy Johnson's, all those names which became household names yeah. for the Expos while they were there, hey, all Carol. started here. Really? Yeah. 
Oh, I must report that back. Yes. So Michael probably wants to come down and start. Yes, here. exactly. Work, work his way up. Uh, <laughs> and many of the guys who were part of that world, what do you want? She, 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 you know, Carol controls my life. Not for long, I gather, I unfortunately. Yeah, and then we're going to interview her about her life and times here. Here. That's a really good idea because she probably knows more than most people, yeah. I would guess. Carol Drake. I know where the keys Unplugged. are. Unplugged. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, she's here for a reason, so thank you. Thank you. She wants, wants us out of here. That's, well, that's we're so going to get ready to just kind of go through how you're going to do the uh, awards. Oh, stuff. okay. So okay. we'll go ahead and do that when you're done. Well, we're, it, we're, we are done. Karen? As soon as I heard baseball, I knew I could come in. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm telling you, Michael, Expos, because there's got to be some still ball players still up there. Uh, because that, who, that, who did the Expos become? I can't remember. They became that, the Washington Nationals, which is a uh, hot, hot team right now. Uh, uh, and some of the folks who, like the Detroit Tigers president, general manager, Dave Dombrowski, was with the Expos. He was, he was their general manager. I can give you a lot of background, because we lived it for 19 years oh, down that's here. That's so funny. So when... when Michael wants to do that piece. Okay, I will pass this on. With Rusty Staub. Yes, I know all these names, even though I'm not a big baseball person, but all these names are familiar to me. Yeah, that would they be were the big, one a big deal. La, la, la Grande Orange. Uh -huh. He was a redhead. Was a rusty Staub. I can help you out here. I can, I can make you look good. <laughs> What an operator this guy is, eh? I'm well aware, yes. <laughs> <laughs> she just, she just oh, I just, she I just blew the cover. <laughs> yeah, you oh. might not have known where she was from, eh? <laughs> oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. Yes, I did. Uh, okay, oh, I'm supposed dear. to say, huh, right? <laughs> yeah. If I'm American, huh? I say, huh. <laughs> and if I'm Canadian, I say, eh. <laughs> yeah, when you go up to Buffalo, the Sabres, you know, hockey games. Right. You go up there, and of course, against the Maple Leafs, it's... More than 50% uh, of the right. people in they're a raucous crowd. Uh -huh. You uh, are not showing that film. I'm not? No. Okay. She uh, will take care of that area. She's going to talk about okay. that. She often, doesn't mind talking about it. Sorry. All right. Uh, what I often do during interviews publicly is to, to get people in a frame of mind that might be a uh, Holocaust, Life and Times, so they're in the Warsaw Ghetto, we might show some Warsaw Ghetto, a little, mm -hmm. she, this lady's from bergen Belsen, and there's actually evidence that was submitted by Jackson at the Nuremberg trial mm -hmm. of the Belsen, bergen Belsen concentration camp. Mm -hmm. uh, graphic, mm -hmm. very mm -hmm. graphic. Uh, and so I was putting it together last night, being my documentary, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> Splice and Dice and little Jackson here, yeah. a little narrative there. Uh, violating just about every copyright right. law, but it's for what the fair heck? use. Right. Fair use doctrine. But anyways, uh, I thought I'd better have a, a taste test because we have some young kids in the audience. Right. Uh, right. How old? Uh, Sophia. Oh, they're, these girls are 13, but younger too will be coming. But no, Drew mentioned. Drew, well, Drew Biter, who's bringing her down, he was our yeah. sensitivity session. Yeah. That means it won't. What we do uh, when we do these interviews, we have. Oh, okay. okay. I stop. I stop.